that song it's a good song but this next song it may be the anthem of the apostolic church let's sing it all in here well the mighty God is Jesus the Prince of Peace is he the everlasting father he eternally the wonderful in wisdom by whom all things were made the fullness of the Godhead well, it's, it's all, all in, in him. him. It's, it's all, all in him. him. The fullness of the Godhead him. is all in him. It's all in him. Oh, it's, it's all, all in him. him. Yeah, the when mighty God is Jesus. And it's all in him. Well, Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Jehovah, Lord of hosts. He's the omnipresent spirit that fills the universe. The advocate. High priest, the lamp was sinner slain, uh, the author of redemption. Hold oh, the glory to his name. Well, it's, it's all, all in him. him. It's, it's all, all in him. him. The fullness the of the Godhead. Him. It's all in him. Yes, it's, it's all, all in him. It's all in him. It's all in him. You know the mighty God, God is Jesus. 
Jesus. And it's all in him. Well, the Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. Uh, the living word incarnate. He's the helpless sinner's friend. Uh, our wisdom and perfection. Our righteousness and power. Yeah, all we need is Jesus. Uh, we find this very hour. Uh, well, it's, it's all, all in him. him. It's all in it's all in him. It's all in him. It's all in him. You know the mighty God is Jesus. And it's all in him. Well, our God for whom we waited will be the glad refrain of the Israel we created. When Jesus comes again, lo, he will come and save us, our king and priest to be. For in him dwells all fullness. All is he. Well, it's, it's all, all in him. him. It's all in him. You know the fullness of the God. Head. It's all in him. It's all in him. It's all in him. Oh, the when mighty God is Jesus. Jesus and it's all in him. Well, he's the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the living word incarnate. Helpless sinners, friend, uh, our wisdom and perfection, uh, our righteousness and power. Yeah, all we need is Jesus Christ to find this very hour. Uh, well, it's all in Him. It's, it's all in Him. All the fullness of the Godhead. It's all, it's all in, in Him. him. Well, it's, it's all in Him. It's all in Him. You know the mighty God is Jesus. And it's all Sing it one him. more time. It's all in him. It's all in him. The fullness of the Godhead. It's all in him. It's all in him. It's all in him. You know the mighty God is Jesus. And it's all in him. The mighty God. The mighty God is Jesus. And it's all in him. He's the mighty God. The mighty God is Jesus. And it's all in him. Aren't you thankful for the revelation of who Jesus is? is tonight. Let's praise him together right now. Hallelujah. Lord, we give you glory and praise in this house, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name, God. Praise God. Praise God. You can be seated just a moment tonight. Thank you so much for worshiping on a Wednesday night. I know, again, we're hearing thunder out there and could definitely be worse where we are tonight, but it Looks like Madison County got more than we got so far. And I'm not going to say it ain't going to be raining cats and dogs when we leave here in a minute. But it uh, looks a lot better than what it could have been. Appreciate you being here on a Wednesday night. We're going to get right into the word of the Lord. We do have some joining us online this evening. And uh, with those storms and all, that has increased that a little bit more. It's good to have Kelly with us tonight. Miss Kelly, so good to have you with us. No, uh, she has been here at least one other time. But uh, we welcome her as a guest on a Wednesday night. And I uh, appreciate, again, everyone making the effort to come. I do need to reduce something here uh, tonight because my wife has asked me to do so. And uh, that is just to remind folks of a stew supper on Saturday. Um, we do need those stew supper supplies here no later than 10 a.m. on Saturday. I know there's a few lines that are still open. And if you can buy something and bring that, uh, that would be wonderful. That helps us um, with making sure we get a profit. And the Lord was with us today. We found the stew meat on sale. Brother Charles, I don't know if we've ever gotten the stew meat this cheap. And uh, chicken leg quarters was on sale. Beef roast was on sale. Both of them at the same store. Normally, we have to run all across town and get all that kind of stuff. But my wife was able to make one stop, and it was all on sale at one place tonight. And so um, if we get all the vegetables donated, it is not going to take a whole lot for us to be able to actually start clearing money. And that's what we want to do. So appreciate it. Now, this community has been waiting on this stew sale so if you know somebody that would like to get some stew they need to call us and leave us a voicemail and because this stew will go very very quick also if you're willing to cook some meat for the stew and pull it uh, make sure you speak to sister Kelsey as soon as church is over tonight she has that meat ready to go and uh, we would appreciate it and what that does is that speeds the prep time up so that when we get here it's able to go right into those pots pretty quick Appreciate you being here tonight. If you need one of the handouts, there is no youth class tonight, so we may have some extra folks that need handouts this evening. Brother Seaton is uh, 
he, he's toughing it out this evening. Uh, one last night on the beach is where he's at. And so he is in Florida, and uh, but he is heading home tomorrow and uh, with my little girl. And uh, I'm hating. I'm not going to get to see her till Saturday night. So uh, I'm leaving in Friday morning. And uh, they're not getting in until late tomorrow evening. So, uh, but Brother Seaton is not here, so there is no youth class tonight. So if you need one of those handouts, slip your hand up. They'll make sure they get one to you. Looks like uh, Brother Amos is batting a 1,000 tonight. Looks like you got them all before it started. That's wonderful. Appreciate it. If you need an ink pen, he's even got those. Holiness has an order. And so we are uh, going to be discussing now. We did the steps to holiness and that didn't take that long. Seemed like inward holiness. We weren't going to ever get out of that, Brother Steve. Felt like we was in that one for a while. Outward holiness. We want to talk about this because while I have said you need to get the inside right, folks, if your inside's right, the outside's going to start showing the fruit. And so, but sometimes it takes a little bit of instruction. Now, first off, let me say this tonight. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, there's going to be some struggle with some of what I'm going to say in the next part of this series because you don't understand what we feel because your desires change when the Holy Ghost comes in. Your perspective on life completely changes when the Holy Ghost comes in. So we, we understand we can't live this holy lifestyle, this life of holiness without the Holy Ghost. Somebody say amen. amen. So holiness has an order. It has to be obeyed in that order first we got to have the right attitude concerning holiness. Having that right attitude throughout the process of holiness will be very key to our outward holiness being acceptable in the sight of God. So once we have the correct attitude, we then understand, we must then understand the principles of holiness laid out in the Word of God. The principles help us to understand why holiness is important to God. And then it gives us guidelines to help us when we face issues of holiness in modern times. I'm kind of reviewing up to where we are right now, okay? So living by principles based on the Word of God is very safe and it is a protected position. So after obtaining a right attitude, after gaining an understanding of God's principles, we can do what we're starting to do right now. We can begin to develop standards of holiness in our lives. We've had eight lessons leading up to where we are right now. This is lesson number nine. Here's your first blank. Inward holiness must be present before true outward holiness can be attained. So I'm just reemphasizing this one more time tonight. Inward holiness, what is it? It's keeping a right spirit, keeping a renewed mind, having a guarded tongue, and having a love for and unity with one another. These things are matters of the inward man, and God desires that our inward parts be holy before him. So the final step of holiness is our outward appearance. Now, I know a lot of people, and, and uh, I'm, I'm actually not yet getting into specifics. I know you're chomping at the bits for me to actually get into some specifics here, and we're going to, believe me. We're going to get there. But I've got to lay some groundwork tonight. How many have ever started talking about why you dress the way you dress or why you act the way you act, and they quote this next scripture that's going up on the wall for us tonight? 1 Samuel 16, 17. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And they use this, Brother Edward, to say God's not concerned about our outward appearance, which is actually not true. When you look at the context, how many believe context in Scripture is very important? Does anybody know where this Scripture falls in in a Bible story in your Bible? The prophet is standing before uh, Jesse's sons and he's deciding who is the Lord choosing to be the next king over Israel. It had nothing to do with being a child of God or not. It was who was going to rule over Israel. And if you look at the scripture, the prophet was actually leaning toward Eliab, the son of Jesse. He assumed that Eliab was going to be the next king because he was the guy that looked the best. 
He looked like he had it together. And, and so he said, surely he's the one anointed of the Lord. And this is when the Lord made Samuel aware. When I'm looking for the next king of Israel, I'm looking for somebody that, ju- that more than just looks the part. I need somebody that has some character and somebody that has the inside right as well. So using this scripture to say that outside holiness doesn't matter is completely taking a verse out of a Bible story that has nothing to do with holiness and is using it to make us feel good for doing what we want to do on the outside. That's what that's doing. So let's don't take verses out of context tonight. So when I start talking about outside holiness, I'm going to take you to areas in the scripture where he actually starts talking about what he expects of us. God is concerned with our outward appearance. Now here we go, your next blank. Our outward appearance is separation from the world And it is our witness of the inward change that God has made in our lives when he fills us with his spirit. All right, I told you I'm not taking verses out of context tonight. I'm going to let you write that word appearance. I know that's a big word. It sometimes takes a little bit to spell. But the Lord, actually, Jesus Christ himself in Matthew shows us the importance of outward holiness. All right? I'm not going to take a verse out of context. Let's go to Matthew chapter 23, and we're going to read three verses, 25 through, uh, actually two verses, 25 through 26. That's my typo there. When he criticizes the religious leaders of the day, here he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. So when he says, don't get the cart before the horse, don't clean up the outside before you clean up the inside, he wants to go ahead and circle the wagons one more time and say, but don't start thinking that the outside doesn't matter. He says, just understand, there is a proper order To holiness. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to drink out of a cup that was clean on the inside, but on the outside, it didn't look clean. I don't say the cup is clean unless it's cleaned inside and out. It turns my stomach. I love Cracker Barrel. But man, there for a while, I couldn't hardly eat at Cracker Barrel. Matter of fact, I, and this, this is how, I'm telling you, when it comes to my silverware and my cups and stuff like that, I can almost become a gerbophobe real quick. And it got to where they couldn't hardly get the silverware clean for a long time. And I'd go to the front desk and I'd embarrass my family. I'd go to the front desk and ask for takeaway silverware and take it in there and eat with it. Because I just can't take it now. And I never will forget the time I was drinking out of a glass. And I turned the glass up. And when I did... On the bottom of the cup, I saw something. It turned my stomach. And I took my straw after I had done downed it. I took my straw and started doing that number. But what I started noticing, what had turned my stomach was not on the inside of the cup. It was actually on the bottom of the cup. You're still still snarling your nose up. That's how I felt too. I didn't feel like the cup was clean unless it was clean inside and out. God does not look at our lives as holy unless we are holy inside and out. So God is concerned about the outside. Yes, the condition of the inside of a person is very important to God. If you've been here eight weeks that we've talked about this, you know I feel very strongly the inside has got to be right. But Jesus in Matthew lets us know inward holiness is what helps us clean up for outward holiness. You wouldn't just wash the inside of a plate and cup without taking the time to make sure the outside's clean also. We have to make sure our outward man is involved in the process of holiness along with our inward man. Somebody say amen. Amen. So now during my research and prayer concerning this subject, I found an analogy that I feel the Lord directed me to. And it was actually a pastor's wife in the Tennessee district. She wrote about this. She said, 
we use holiness as three different sticks. A nightstick, a measuring stick, and a walking stick. I thought this was real neat. A nightstick is used primarily for law enforcement, she said. Police officers use it to subdue or beat down somebody that's committing an offense. And she said, sometimes as Christians, we'll use holiness as a nightstick to force people to submit to our beliefs. Now, she's not condoning this. She's just saying we've done it. A nightstick is never viewed in a positive manner by its victim. Police officer hauls off and hits somebody with a nightstick. I guarantee you nobody's turned around and said, thank you, officer, for hitting me. It is a tool to inflict pain and keep a person in line with a set of rules. And folks, let me stop right here. If we ever start using holiness like a nightstick, we're never going to have anybody stay in the church. There is a proper stick to use. In just a minute, we're going to get there. A measuring stick. Now, a measuring stick is only as good as the measurement you assign. Here's the deal. The only person who knows the measurement is the person with the stick. Many times, we'll use outward, outward holiness like a measuring stick. If somebody don't meet up to my expectations or measurements, then they're not holy. Hold on. Jesus said you better get the beam from out of your eye before you start working on the splinter in somebody else's. Luke 6. He was telling us, be careful about pulling out your holiness measuring sticks and using them on each other. It'll come back to bite you every single time. You got to line up to my holiness. No, they got to line up to God's holiness. Here's the one we want to use. The purpose of a walking stick is to help balance a person. This is the kind of holiness we need to emulate and strive to produce here at Harvest Church. Holiness in our lives is to bring balance so that we can please God and be accepted into his presence. A walking stick can only benefit somebody if the person with the stick has balance. Stop right here. You cannot help someone else produce holiness unless you first have the balance of holiness in your life. I want to have a walking stick holiness so that it can produce balance in my life, but then I, in return, can help someone else find balance in their lives as well. So we don't want to use holiness like a nightstick and hurt people with it. I've seen people almost beat people up over stuff. Now, I'm not saying we condone anything, but you, you just don't have to use them in certain areas of leadership and that kind of thing and let them grow in it. Uh, don't use it as a nightstick. Don't use it as a measuring stick where we're comparing ourselves to one another instead of the Lord Jesus Christ, but use it as a walking stick where there is a balance in our lives. One of my greatest concerns, and it scares me to death, Brother Cannon, when I start hearing an upcoming generation say they don't believe that some of the outward holiness standards that we've held fast to for so many years are important anymore. I'm not blind to the fact that culture is different and that perhaps there are a few things that due to the advancement of this age have morphed over time to reflect some modernization. Now, I know that makes you nervous. The, these always need to be weighed against the underlying principle from the Word of God before changing. I'm going to give you an example of this. It might be in regard to the topic of television. Many years ago, TV was a unit in your home that had these big old rabbit ears that brought in no more than four channels. So basically what they did was they preached against these in their homes and allowing them to steal time and distract the attention from God. However, due to the event of so much technology, we have had to adjust our viewpoint because now the box is not just in a home. People are carrying it around on their cell phones, their computers, their tablets. I got all three standing right here. So now if I preach against the box... And I'm walking around with all three of these. What's the world going to look at you and say? Hypocrite. So what was the underlying principle that they were preaching for? Don't let something steal your time and keep you from developing a walk with God. Or the principle was we need to make a covenant with our eyes as Job stated, and not put any wicked thing before our eyes. Not just television. There's bad apps out there you can download. There's websites you can go to. There's things you can get on your tablet that are not holy. So the underlying principle is still the same. The holiness standard has not changed. What has changed is how are we affected. 
how are we applying this principle in our lives? If we preach against cell phones, if we preach against computers, if we preach against the TV, if we preach, what's going to happen is you're going to keep attacking the modes, but you're not getting to the principle behind the whole thing, and the devil is going to start tripping us up. Well, pastor didn't say this was wrong. So let's get to the principle of the issue. The principle of the issue is to be holy. I don't need garbage in front of me to digest it every day. And if I live my life by this principle, then it doesn't matter where the box is or what the enemy tries to sneak it in by. I'm always going to make sure I'm living a holy life by the word of God. And so I strongly push, you need to base your outward holiness standards on biblical principles. I just quoted you biblical principles. Make a covenant with your eyes like Job said. Don't put any wicked thing before your eyes. That even goes down to text messages. So with that said, I do feel this generation has got to be extremely careful that we don't allow using, and that we're not using culture to move us away from the principles of the Word of God. So in the Old Testament, we see the story of Moses at the burning bush. Now, the whole passage that that you could read, and I'm not going to read the whole thing tonight, Exodus 3, verses 3 through 5, I'm going to focus, I'm drawn to verse number 5. He said, draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. God began right at this moment to teach Moses a lesson regarding holiness, standards, and his presence. Now, if you remember in earlier lessons, and I'm talking about lessons one, two, and three, I told you holiness is all about access to the presence of God. The more of this world that you put off, the more access to God's presence you're going to experience. The Mount Sinai example I gave to you, I've used it in this series, and it explains this concept. Moses could ascend to the top of the mountain because he learned a principle of putting off something to have more access to the presence of God. He learned that right here in Exodus chapter 3. God showed Moses that outward holiness is important to him and God chose an item of clothing for Moses to remove as a symbol as a symbol that he was willing to be cleansed so that he could approach the Almighty God. All right. You say, well, that was good for Moses. What about now? All right, there came the day Moses is passing off the scene and the next pastor stepping up. God anoints Joshua. He says, you're going to become the leader. You're going to be the pastor of Israel. Joshua's ready to begin the greatest period of revival and growth that Israel would see. But before this takes place, God wants to make sure the new generation still lives by a principle that was established in the previous generation. And you find it in Joshua chapter 5 verses 13 through 15 we see the story of Joshua standing at the precipice of his greatest victory Jericho and he lifts up his eyes and he sees a man standing with a sword drawn Joshua walks over to him and he says are you for us or are you for our adversaries the angel responds by basically saying neither I'm on the Lord's side (laughs) what a reflection of holiness because holiness is not about you it's about the kingdom it's about the presence of God And it's about the power of the Almighty God. I want to go back. Joshua chapter 3 verse 15. God is speaking to Joshua. And he asks him to do something. Look at this. He's speaking to Joshua, not Moses. Loose thy shoe from off your foot. For the place that you're standing is holy. What's he doing here? He's saying, young leader, young pastor. There are some principles that never change. To get into the presence of a holy God, you cannot, rem- you cannot forget the symbol that Moses had to learn. And that is sometimes you got to put off some things uh, to get into my presence. Some things, I'm talking about there may be new leaders, there may be a new territory to claim, there may be a new level to reach, but the way to get into the presence of God never changes you got to make sure you still know the formula of how to get into his presence. And friend, that is holiness. 
And so my greatest concern when I see men and women around that have been raised under the, under the burning bush principle of holiness and they get access to God, but then I see them begin to move away stating they don't feel or think that it's important anymore. When I look back at two of the greatest leaders in the Bible, Moses and Joshua, they each lead at different times. They were in different eras. They gained different territory and worked with different people. If you remember that one generation had to die off before Joshua could come on the scene and take them to that next level. And so he was moving with different people. But listen, they lived under the same principle and purpose and vision of holiness, and that was to get access to the Almighty God. So to truly understand and explain outward holiness in this day and age, we've got to look at this from three perspectives. First, what does the Bible teach concerning the issues. This book is not irrelevant. It's still talking today. The Bible is our foundation of beliefs. And friend, it's very important that we are able to back up things with the Word of God. I heard it explained this way one time. Where the Bible speaks, you speak. And where the Bible is silent, shut your mouth and be silent. We must have the word to back up our beliefs. If you can't explain it from scripture, honey, you need to go back and look at it because there's probably scripture there that you had never seen before. We don't just preach things to be preaching them. We've got to have the word of God to back up our beliefs. So first, look at the Bible. This next one's going to scare you. Look at history. Second, we must look at history. We have to understand Our culture has changed some things, particularly in the past decade. And what were those motivating factors that causes us to believe certain things are okay today when just a little over 100 years ago they were wrong, wrong, wrong? we got to dig below the surface to see how our worldly culture has affected our standards of holiness. Now third, we got to take principles found in the Scriptures and our culture's history into account when making up a standard for living holy in modern times. So we're going to look in this series, we're going to look at several areas of holiness using these perspectives over the next few weeks and as we continue to study holiness on Wednesday night. Now I trust that when we have finished this series, if pastor's done his job right, you're going to have a better understanding and a deeper appreciation for dedicating yourself to the Lord through holiness and even outward holiness. Our outward appearance is not only a reflection of our inward condition, but it also identifies who we are. Think of it this way. It's in your handout. Here's your blank. When we walk through the mall, folks, we have a conversation with everyone we pass and we never say a word. Folks, what you wear says something about who you are and what you believe in. The world acknowledges this fact by placing certain people in easily identifiable uniforms. For instance, a policeman walks in, even my little boy is going to notice police officer. We was eating on Main Street last night before prayer meeting in a Mexican restaurant down there. Police car pulls up. We're sitting there. My back was to it. He says, police car. And I thought, oh boy, what's happening outside? He had just pulled up to a red light. I turned around. Sure enough, he recognized there are certain identifiable uniforms, even firefighters, doctors, athletic teams, prisoners, etc. They wear clothes that identify them as who they are. Even though the world wants to tell us we can be independent in our dress, Their actions even say something entirely different. We identify people and we pass judgment on their beliefs according to their outward appearance. Went to physical therapy the other day. Man, they hurt you. They they don't play around. They found found a certain way that knee's going to pop every time. So they said, let's just do that 20 times. No lie, 20 times. I'm standing there going, look, Doc, this ain't going. I wouldn't just let anybody do that, but because they had scrubs on, I knew they, they knew what they were doing, or I hoped they did, you know. <laughs> but now, if somebody out here tonight was to come up, I don't, I, you know, I don't know if somebody is in here tonight incognito that's a doctor, and I don't know it, but if you walked up to me in your suit and just said, hey, I want, I want to twist around on your leg, I'm going to look at you and say, uh-uh. <laughs> ain't happening. 
We pass judgment by how people are dressed. It's just how it happens. Now I want to take you to Genesis 38. The Bible tells the story of a woman who deceived her father-in-law by changing her manner of dress. Her father-in-law. The story shows us that even, when, even then, back in Bible times, Genesis chapter 38, people were identified by how they were dressed. Judah thought that his own daughter-in-law, Tamar, was a prostitute by how she was dressed. Look at it, Genesis 38, 15. Judah saw her, and when he did, he thought her to be an harlot. Why? Because she was dressed. She had her hair, or her head covered. Her face was covered. Now, Proverbs 17 also mentions the attire of an harlot. We cannot say that what we wear is not important when the world identifies it as important. 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10, the scripture says this, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair. You, you, you take that word broided, that does not mean braided. Let's don't get ignorant. Broided literally meant they weaved things into their hair. Y'all remember this fad that started going around and people were literally weaving feathers into their hair? That's what it's talking about. They didn't do feathers. They did gold. All right? Read the rest of the scripture. Broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. But which becometh women professing godliness with good works. The word modest here is the Greek word for kosmios, which means well, orderly, and proper. How we dress and behave, folks, says a lot about who we are as a people. We profess godliness or that we're trying to be like Him, yet our appearance can deny the fact that we are His. we got to understand that what we wear identifies whom we belong to. Genesis 1. God created man in His own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. When mankind is born, God has created either male or female. It was not the creation's choice to decide what he is but it was the decision of the Creator. We were created with the purpose from the Creator to reflect the image of the Almighty God. And the way that God creates us is the way that He desires to see us. There is a distinction in dress and gender. Genesis specifically tells us we were created beautiful and that there is a difference between male and female. We are identified as His by the way we adorn ourselves outwardly. If that makes sense, somebody say amen. I've only got a couple pages left. We're almost done. Earlier in our series, we discussed the importance of principles, and we understand that there are many areas in which the Bible is very clear. That it, this is not a suggestion, but the Bible says this is a commandment, and here's the principle that's attached to it. The same applies in the Christian discipleship area of holiness. There are certain holiness standards that have a very clear and defined spiritual principle attached to them. And as we are obedient to these standards, what we do is we release that principle to work in our lives. But there are some holiness standards that the Word of God does not have a clear, defined spiritual principle attached to it. I'm going to give you an explanation. Hang in here, because I've never explained it this way in the eight years I've been pastoring, but I feel like I now understand it better than I ever have. As we study these standards throughout the Bible, we're going to come across some that we're going to refer to as positional standards. Your next blank is positional Sorry, I came about that a little weird. That was my fault. Let me explain. 
I don't know that I got this in your handout. In other words, as people moved their position closer to God, they applied these standards in their lives. And when they would drift away from God, they would go back and start picking up certain things. That's why we call them positional standards. When looking at the standards found in the Word of God, we see there are two that have a very clear, defined spiritual principle applied to them, and that is clothing and hair. I don't know how you can get any more clearer than the way the Word of God addresses these two. And when we obey in these areas, we release the blessing of the spiritual principle. The hair is the submission to God and the submission to our spouse, the clothing. Uh, we'll, we'll go through those principles, okay? So when we disobey, we also release the curse of the spiritual principles in our lives. When we are not submitted to God, we bring about certain things that will happen to us as a result. The decisions that we make have consequences, whether they are good or bad. So there are some other standards that the word does not have a clear, defined spiritual principle applied to it. But as you read the biblical accounts of them, you're going to realize that these were positional standards. Here's your blank. When God desired his people to be closer to him, he would request them to remove these items. He says, okay, before you try to get close to me, I want you to take this off and I want you to go do away with this. He never would let them bring their idols. Those things were positional standards. You're not going to get close to me unless you get rid of them. When the people would grow cold in the Lord, what would they have? They went back and found themselves some idols again. Moses is up here receiving a word from the Lord. They take those earrings out and they melt them down. And what do they do? They make an idol. <laughs> a calf. At that point, they did not have a commandment from God. You'll have no other gods before me. They had grown cold toward Moses and God. And they drifted back and picked up some things that were positional standards. All right? Positional standards outwardly will show the condition of our spiritual relationship and commitment to God. They show our position with Him. Now I know my mom was the, the world's best about having these little funny sayings. And they came from her mom is where they came from, you know. I actually got in trouble a couple of times, Brother White, because I knew how to push my grandmother's buttons and just get her flying off the handle and using those sayings. And there was a couple of times my mom said, you know what you're doing. You better stop, you know. Uh, me and my Uncle Carl, Lord help us. We would get in there and get her to go. And, and finally, Dad would just clear his throat and look at me like, you better quit. You're going to get in trouble. But one of those sayings that my mom even kind of passed down, and you've probably heard it as well, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Basically, what that saying is, if it's good for men... It's good for women. In other words, both have got to do the same thing. In the apostolic world, though, I've heard people make comment like, well, there's a whole lot more standards for women than there are men. That's hogwash. And I'm going to prove it in this series. Because there, just like there's a standard for women... There is a same spiritual principle for a man to follow. It's just applied in a different way. So I disagree with that. There's a whole lot more for women in the army. No. As you follow through these standards in the rest of this series, you're going to see every single one of them needs to be applied for the goose and the gander. There may be a different application, but they're going to have to have the same obedience to the principle and the positional standards that are asked of us by God. Brother Cannon's coming back to music tonight. We're going to do one more blank here. When we talked about spiritual principles earlier, we noted there are two standards that have definite spiritual principles applied to them. That is clothing and hair. These are the same for both men and women, but they are applied differently. In other words, they have different application. This means that there's a standard for clothing and hair for men and women in Scripture. They each, man and woman, 
are expected to participate in the standard so that the spiritual principle will be applied and the attached blessing or curse will be released in their lives as a result of how they respond to it. It does no good if the wife is applying the principle in the hair, but the man is not. You're messing up the whole thing in your family. So that's why I'm saying every principle, we, we can go through the line, okay? Every one of them, it applies for the goose and the gander. And I just, I've referred to y'all as geese twice this month. I got to quit, don't I? Talk about the formation of geese and how we want that honking section, yeah. Outward holiness is important. It's important. I'm trying to lay some groundwork because next week we start getting into specifics, okay? And uh, we're going to deal with clothing and hair, and I don't know if I can get both of them done in one night or not, but I'm going to try. I'm going to try to explain this the best that I can. And I'm going to try to bring it down in common terms where you can understand, okay? Because too many times we've been asked why and we can't answer. Folks, we got to have the Word to back us up. Not just, well, I'm fourth generation Pentecost and that's how I've always done it. That's good. Celebrate that heritage. But know what the Word says about it. Why did Grandma live that way? Why did she feel so strongly about it? She didn't just wake up one day and do it. She understood the word of God. You walked into the coffee tables of those houses in America back in those days and what was there? Family Bible. They didn't just live those lives. I mean, there was good people, not Holy Ghost filled, but still living good lives. Why? Because on that coffee table was a family Bible. And it wasn't there to collect dust either. It was on the coffee table in the middle of the room, not on a shelf in the corner. And they'd open that Bible up. I remember the one we had at our house. Some little pictures in them things were hideous, but I remember the one we had. And it was big, big pictures and would, would talk about, I could tell you almost the story by looking at the picture. It was so vivid. I never will forget the picture of Abraham up on the mountain about to kill Isaac. And over in the corner in the thicket on that page was a ram. I could look at those stories and remember what my Sunday school teacher had taught me and it was being reinforced at home. And when we would have devotions, mom and dad would go to that family Bible because they wanted us to understand that in the middle of the room it's an access point for us all to be able to go to. I don't know whatever came of that family Bible. I hope one day I get it back. I imagine they moved it with them when they went to, to Dixon, but I hope I can get that back. I know there's a big Bible we've used here at the library. It's a big family Bible when we do the pledge to the Bible. Why? We want people to understand it is the central focal point of our lives. I've got to have the word to back up what I believe. Please, if somebody asks you, why do you do this? Why do you do that? Don't use me as your scapegoat and say, because pastor said do it. Know the word. And if you don't know, call me. I'll walk you to the scripture. I've done it numerous times with people. Here's the verse. Here's what you need to look at. That broided hair thing, I had to really study on that one because that one kind of bothered me a little bit. Knew it wasn't right. I was feeling it wasn't right, but couldn't find it. I ended up calling some other ministers, and they pointed me to the right access point. We think there's new things coming at us today, but this book says there's nothing new under the sun. The answer is right here, and it's been in front of us for ages. Don't brush this off just as another book, but allow it to govern and direct your life. Let's stand together tonight. I know it's 8.20. We're normally wrapping up around 8.30, and I think we're going to get there. As we start dealing with specifics, please remember, this is not going to be pastor's opinion. If you want to know my opinion, I'll tell you later, but I ain't going to tell you right here because this ain't for my opinion. This is for us to preach the Word, Paul said. So everything we're going to study is going to be between the Word of God and us. If there's something that's taught that we don't, we're kind of struggling with, Go to the author with it and talk to him and say, God, give me revelation because there's some things that you have to have revelation to understand. None of us got here by ourselves. You did not find the Lord. 
the Lord found you. You didn't find this place. The Bible says no man gets to the Father unless the Spirit first draws him. You didn't get here on your own. You're not going to get to heaven on your own. You're going to have to have a revelation from the Almighty God. Lord, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you today that we can live holy on the outside. We've talked about inside holiness for a long time. This, this eight weeks, we've talked about inside holiness and how to get here. And God, now we're getting into some specifics. And Lord, before we ever do that next week, I pray, God, that you would condition our hearts, Lord, that as we go through personal Bible study and as we spend time alone with you, you're probably going to already start dealing with us about things. And then we're going to cover them in these lessons. And God, we need you to direct us. Help us today to always understand understand that Lord we're, we're, we're approaching your word with an open heart as a mirror God that you can show us not just who we are but also show us maybe as a light as the scripture would say to show us in the, the direction that we need to head God help us today not to try to change the word to fit our lifestyle but to change our lifestyle to fit your word in Jesus name amen let's close with a little I bit of worship tonight would you sing this together I will give you all I will give all. If all is what you ask of me, I will not withhold. And if my sacrifice is less, then give you my very best. Help me remember Calvary's cost and be willing to say yes. I will give you all If all is what you ask of me Then I will not withhold Lord, and if my sacrifice is less Than giving you my very best Help me remember Calvary's cause and be willing to say yes. Oh, yes, I would give you all. Lord, I would give you all. If all is what you ask of me, Lord, then I will not withhold. And if my sacrifice is less, then give you my Help me remember Calvary's cost and be willing to say Would you sing it one more time? Say, Lord, I will give you Would you make it your prayer on this Wednesday night? Lord, I will give you all. If all is what, if all is what you ask of me, Lord, then I will not withhold. Oh, and if my sacrifice is less than giving you my very best, Lord, help me remember Calvary's cost and be willing to say, and if my sacrifice, say, and if my sacrifice is less than giving you my very best, help me remember and be willing to sing it one more time if my sacrifice and if my sacrifice is less than giving you my very best help me remember Calvary's cause and be willing to say yes thank you for attending our midweek refresh tonight appreciate you being here do appreciate the faithfulness of the house of the Lord from you as the people of God. Don't forget Saturday, the prep begins at 10 o'clock, and uh, we need some young people to also come and help lift those pots and learn how to cook this stew from our elders. We will have, I'm sure, plenty of older folks here, but we do want to make sure we got younger people to be able to carry those pots, clean them out, uh, being able to make sure we hook that propane and all that up to cook the stew. We want all the supplies here by 10 o'clock, so if you can, make sure and get those here. Also, if you can sign up for something, there's still a few things left out there. If you can cook the meat, make sure you see Sister Wilkerson. She will be at the back tonight and uh, should be able to get that to you if you can do that. God bless you. Shake hands together. Greet one another in the name of the Lord. So good to have you with us tonight.
turned itself off. I had to restart it. 